sometimes when you're building a mask, you need to soften the transition between what is masked and what is not masked. In this video, we're going to look at how you can control that. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 111 of Understanding Darktable. Fiji was great. Thank you. Uh, before I went to Fiji, someone raised the issue that when working with masks, there are these four little triangles, and I just keep on using them, and for some reason had not even thought to mention exactly how they work. So, what I've done is gone into GIMP and created this simple image here, which has got a color blend from cyan and magenta on the horizontal axis, and then I've overlaid a black to white gradient vertically uh, to create this sort of weird anomaly here. The reason I've done that will become apparent. Okay, let's suppose you are trying to mask based on hue. Okay, and what would be a good module to use for this? I will go color balance RGB uh, because I will introduce a hue shift that will make it fairly obvious as to whether or not we've achieved our goal. So let's suppose we want to change the hue to yeah, something a little bit yellowish, like so. But we only want to affect the cyan tones that are within our image. We would come down here and we would go parametric mask. And then we would go to the HZ channel. And what we would do is we would use these four triangles to try and narrow down the mask so it's only picking up the pixels we want to pick up. Now, if I come in like so and come in like so and turn on the mask, we can see that I've built a mask which is targeting the cyan hues within the image, but the transition between what is selected in the mask and what is not selected in the mask is fairly abrupt. And sometimes we don't want it to be that abrupt. So these four triangles, essentially the two triangles on the top denote the point or the value at which the mask reaches 100% opacity. And the two triangles on the bottom denote the point or the value at which the mask reaches 0%. Now, rather than demonstrate that on the hue, let's just go to the luminosity. So let's suppose I don't want to select the darker cyans, I only want to select the brighter cyans that are in the bottom left hand corner of the image. So what I want to do is reduce the mask so it does not include the darkest parts of the cyan pixels in the image. Okay, But again, this transition is very harsh. Now, remember I said the top triangle represents the point at which the mask is at 100% opacity. In other words, it's solid yellow. And the bottom triangle represents the point at which the mask is completely disappeared. In other words, whatever underlying pixels were there before will come through unaffected. So to create a transition, we simply drag one triangle away from the other. Now you'll notice that if I drag the bottom one, as soon as it gets to the same value as the top one, then they both move in concert. Same goes when I'm moving in the opposite direction. If I use the top one, then they move together. But if I then drag them apart, we are creating this transition zone between this point, which is sort of around here, which is where our mask is at 100% opacity, and 
the value represented by the bottom triangle, which is this point up here, which is where the mask falls off to 0% opacity. So anything in between is this soft transition. Now, if you've ever used Photoshop or GIMP or Affinity Photo or any image editing app like that, you should have already encountered these triangles in the blending modes within those applications. It's a fairly consistent, ubiquitous way of handling these transition zones. And the same applies for the bright end, right? If we bring this down, we see now that the very brightest luminosities are now being excluded from our mask. But again, if we wanted to create a transition, we would simply drag our 0% you know, indicator away. And so now we've got this soft ramp of you know, the way the mask is built relative to our brightest and darkest pixels in the image. Okay, let's suppose we actually want to keep all of the brightest pixels, but we only want the, you know, the, the brightest cyan pixels and nothing else. We've still got this fairly harsh transition over here, and that's more to do with the hue than it is to do with the luminosity. So let's go back to our hue, and let's see what we can do to try and soften off this part of the mask on the right hand side yep there it is there it is again you can see with these two triangles right at the very minimum saturation value we've got a fairly harsh transition but if we bring our top triangle away then we start to soften that part of the mask so the area that we have masked has now got a much softer transition all the way around it. And if we then turn the mask off, we will see that we have shifted those hues towards yellow. Anything that was outside of the mask is going to retain its original color, saturation and luminosity. And hence why we can still see traces of cyan here because those pixels are either in the transition zone or they're outside the transition zone. If that was a problem and we needed to get rid of more of the cyan, then we would go back to our mask and say, okay, we need probably here in the uh, luminosity range, we're going to you know, be a little bit more aggressive with our mask there so that we'll get rid of some more of the cyan. So it's all a case, I guess, I guess you would say it's a balancing act. You know, it's a case of where does my mask need to be 100%, where does my mask need to be 0%, and just fine tuning those transition points. Now, quite often, you're not going to be able to do it with just parametric masking alone. You will need to go to drawn and parametric masking and that's the subject of another video. I'm not going to get into that today. But one other thing that I do want to cover whilst we're on this subject of transition zones is if we turn our mask back on, we do also have these four sliders down the bottom. The feathering radius, the blurring radius, the mask opacity, and the mask contrast. The feathering radius you know what feathering does. It simply softens the edges of the mask. So as we increase that value, our mask gets a softer feather all the way around the edge. If we turn the mask off, we can see the transition between our adjusted hue pixels, which we were pushing towards yellow, and the cyan pixels is now softer, okay, because of that feathering radius. As we back that off, we can see that transition becomes more harsh. As we increase it, it gets softer. So that's the feathering radius. Okay, so just gone and trawled through my images from Fiji. This is one particular image of the torch lighting uh, ceremony that they do each night. Now I've already processed this image and I've done a bit with it. The red that you're seeing there is actually the over and under exposed indicator. Don't think it's actually 
cooked into the image like that. I've got a second instance of color calibration just for the sky, and that was there just to introduce a little bit of a, a bluish tone to the sky, just to create some contrast with the strong reds that are in you know his skin and the fire and so on. Don't worry about the double chromatic adaptation being applied. I did that intentionally. If we turn on the mask, we can see that what I've done here is I've used a drawn and a parametric mask. The drawn element is a gradient filter that just is applied to the top half of the image. And then the parametric side, I have used the saturation and the luminosity to try and exclude the guy as much as possible from the mask and exclude the fire. So it's really only affecting the sky in the background. In terms of the blurring radius, I want you to watch around the edges of the cloud. If we increase the blurring radius, it's different to feathering radius. It's actually blurring the pixels of the mask, not just creating a feather around the edges of the mask, if that makes sense. It is different and you probably need to play with it on some of your own images to really wrap your head around how the feathering and the blurring are different. But trust me, they are. In terms of mask opacity, you can see that we can change the opacity of the mask with the opacity slider, like so, to the point where it's <laughs> completely disregarding the gradient um, filter that I had put on in the drawn section of the mask. So set that back to zero. And the contrast of the mask will... I haven't done this yet, but I'm guessing where this fall off is from the gradient mask, that transition will become compacted so that the fall off will happen much faster. And yep, that's exactly what happens. That allows you to alter the contrast of the pixels which make up the mask. It's not about the pixels of the underlying image, it's about the pixels that make up the mask. So you're affecting the contrast of the pixels in the mask or the opacity of the pixels in the mask. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. Hopefully that has helped. Like I said, I'm still gonna do another video about drawn and parametric masks in conjunction uh, because we've still got lots to cover in the exploration of masks in Darktable. Again, questions, comments, feedback, sing out down below and I will catch you in the next one.